What's up everybody? This is Lisa Fields, the founder and president of the Jude 3 Project, and you're about to watch a conversation from Courageous Conversations 2021. However, before we get into that, I want to cordially invite you to Courageous Conversations 2022. The theme this year is the scholar and the skeptic. We're back in Washington, D.C. at National Community Church with seven amazing conversations. Conversations like, is there a God? Should we trust the Bible? Is Christianity a white man's religion? Does Christianity oppress women? Is Christianity homophobic and transphobic? Should we be spiritual or religious? Is Christianity bad for our mental health? We want to give you a blueprint on how to have courageous conversations with gentleness and respect. Remember, we sold out last time, so make sure you register early and get your ticket now. If you can't join us in person, you have the virtual option as well. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. This next session is politics in the pulpit. And this is an important conversation because many leaders struggle with how to incorporate politics in their pulpit. And because many struggle, they leave it out altogether. However, we believe that it's important in reclaiming Christianity that we're able to engage these conversations faithfully. So we have four amazing panelists to help us navigate this space. So we wanna to welcome to the stage, Dr. Marvin McMichael, Dr. Jacqueline Rivers, Dr. Yolanda Pierce, and Tabidi Anabole. This panel will be moderated by Corey Porter. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I am not Corey Porter. Just want to make sure we clear that up. Uh, my name is Stephen Harris. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, to moderate this panel. Thank you all for, for being here uh, yesterday, for those of you who are here and today. Um, to engage in these conversations. We want to uh, make sure that we, we have enough time to get into some questions and then uh, field questions from the audience. So uh, for that purpose, I wanna make sure that those of you, particularly if you weren't here yesterday, um, if you have a question that you want to submit to the panel, um, you can either use the QR code, which should be in the, the booklet, um, or you can go to pigeonhole.at, www.pigeonhole.at, uh, and put in the, the passcode uh, CC21. Uh, that way you can register your questions and I'll be looking at them uh, as we converse here. And then when it's time for the Q&A, uh, we'll, we'll pick from some of those um, uh, to discuss. All right, amen? I can't see any of y'all because of the light, so I need to hear an audible amen. amen. Okay, okay, amen, amen. Um, really important uh, conversation, as, as all of them have been. Um, so I want to begin with some intentional uh, framing. Uh, this first question is going to go to, to all of our panelists. Um, and it, it has to do with uh, faithfully engaging in the realm of politics from pulpit ministry. Um, but I, I want to frame it in a particular kind of way. So when we think about even the title of this panel, Pulpit Politics, there is an, an almost, there's a sense in which one feels um, attention, right? One of the reasons why this conversation is compelling is because of the fact that when you think about pulpit ministry and politics, um, one might, might feel like uh, there, there's at least one aspect of a sense in which these two arenas, these two spaces are to, to adopt Christological language, they are not of the same substance, right? There, there, is, there are particular distinct interests that are engaged in the political arena. There's distinct interests that pulpit ministry addresses. So in one sense, there's this felt tension. But at the same time, there's this impulse, there's this burden uh, from pulpit ministry, from church leaders to it wade into these waters, right? And there's a lot that informs that, history, theology, issues of uh, uh, the economy, right? The, addressing the material conditions of black life and of all life. So there, there are, are incentives on both sides to refrain and then to engage. I want our panelists, where everybody's gonna answer, give language around those two sentiments, right? The, the one that says, no, I shouldn't, right? Where does that come from? What does that emerge from? And the impulse that says, no, we have to. We have to talk about these things. And, and, and how are those two sentiments reconciled, right? What's the, what's the faithful reconciliation of those two felt sentiments when we think about politics and pulpit ministry? And we're all gonna, gonna, gonna take a shot at this one. Who wants to start us off? Well, as a Baptist pastor, never at a loss for words. Um, I should begin 
by identifying my origins uh, at Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City. I started in ministry there in 1972. It was the same year that Adam Clayton Powell Jr. died. So when people say to me that religion and politics ought to be kept separate, I am a bit confounded because of my origins. Um, I don't know that there is a way or a reason why they should be separated. Now, if you talk about religion in terms of supporting a particular candidate, should you endorse a person, you know, that kind of, should you identify yourself as a part of a political party, that is one thing, electoral politics. But in terms of themes and in terms of issues and in terms of the ways in which public policy impact life for people who belong to our congregations, uh, and then the civil discourse more broadly. Uh, for instance, right now, there are a variety of topics that are political in nature, but that have implications for the life of the church. Where does one stand, for instance, on the issue of women's reproductive rights? That's a political as well as a theological question. What is one going to say about voting rights and access to the ballot box? What about climate change? All of these and many, many more are matters that one could say, oh, that's political and they ought not be brought up in the church. I would say, no, that is life. It, it may have a political component to it, but I don't think you can keep those kinds of things out. You ought to be engaged, I think, in the voting process. You ought to be engaged in public discourse. Uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to hear others. But for me, I am predisposed to be as aggressive and as involved in political life as, as the Constitution allows. I've never knowingly, publicly, clearly endorsed a candidate. Of course I have, but you know, I've found ways to do it uh, without giving myself away. But no, I, I've, I fall on the side of very aggressively involved. Thank you. Dr. Rivers? So I, I certainly want to agree that I think we have a biblical mandate to be involved in politics because we are told by Jesus that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, we're a city on a hill. We have to be the conscience of the society, at least we ought to be. Too often we fail to be, but we ought to be. So I think it's really important for us to be uh, deeply involved. I do also think that there is an important distinction to be drawn between uh, politics in terms of the fact that politics exists in everything we do and electoral politics. I think there is really a danger that white evangelicals, for example, have fallen into in being so strongly identified with one political party. Now, it's also true that uh, African Americans who are overwhelmingly Christians, but those who are Christians and those who are not, are strongly identified with another political party, but not in quite the same way in which white evangelicals have fallen into that trap. So I think in that sense, we really have to be very careful that we, it's clear that we as Christians don't belong to any political party. They don't own us. That we're going to be faithful to biblical principles regardless of our party affiliation. And I think that that is really a challenge for pastors. It, it is, it, it's funny because when I first met my husband, um, we were undergraduates at Harvard and we had a three hour conversation. Our first conversation was a three hour debate, vigorous debate over just this issue. <laughs> were Christians supposed to be political? And I was firmly apolitical. But now that I look back, I'm like, why was I so apolitical? I think it was just part of the tradition. And especially um, Christians who are Pentecostal, charismatic, perhaps misinterpret the scripture that says we should be in the world but not of it. And so see this as beyond the purview of Christians. But I think that there's a long history of the black church playing an important political role. Perhaps um, one of the ones that is less well known was the role of 
black Baptist women at the end of the 18th cent 19th century coming into the 20th century and how active they were both advocating for racial justice against lynching and other forms of racial oppression and advocating for full inclusion of women in the political sphere uh, for suffrage. So we have a storied history of it, we have a biblical mandate, but we also have to be very careful in how we do it. So I would just join in agreement. Um, I think that sometimes when people hear the word politics, that they think that we're talking about um, who is the person running from for office, right? Um, that's not the definition of politics. So the political is deeply personal and the political is also connected to how we do the work of justice. And so if you are a believer in a justice loving God, you have to be involved politically. When you live in a nation where whether you have access to clean water is a political decision, then you cannot not be involved in that decision, right? When you live in a nation where who has access to health care, who has access to food, who lives in a food desert are political decisions, then as a believer in Christ who is called to set captives free and to ensure that the hungry are fed and to ensure that those who, who have needs, those needs are met, then I have to do that work, right? So we have to stop thinking that to be involved in politics is only to be involved at the electoral level. That's a wonderful thing. And for those of you who are doing that kind of work, that's wonderful. But the political work of the pulpit, the political work of the pews is the work of justice. And so that means you have to be deeply engaged. It is a nation in which we make determinations, literal determinations about how many jails we'll build based on reading levels and test scores of children. Those are political decisions. I challenge you today that if you are a believer in Christ to be uninvolved in those kinds of decisions in your community and your nation and your world is to actually turn your back on a commandment by God to love your neighbor. So for me, this question is a resolved question because of the mandate to do justice that the scripture tells us that we have to do. You want to let, let it separate for Yeah, I want to let the mic smoke a little bit. And, <laughs> uh, so honored to be with, with, with each of you and to, to have this conversation. Stephen, you, you framed the question in terms of um, pastors who may be feeling some tension about this. And I, I would um, want to say two things. Um, first is I think that tension uh, is perhaps less common in the black church tradition for all the reasons that have been articulated, that, that what some people commonly call politics is in fact an argument about the good life that grows up out of whatever moral perspective people are bringing into the public square. And that conversation has often been an existential threat for black folk. So we've not had the, the luxury of being able to say that over there is political and we're just gonna come over here and do this thing abstracted from that. And so, um, that hard line between what is moral, what is biblical, what is ethical, and what is quote unquote political um, is not a hard line that we have historically drawn, drawn. That's the first thing. Second thing is to get to your question, the way you framed it in terms of what are some of the tensions. Um, I, I think about there probably, as I've thought about your question, maybe five things that create that tension for some pastors. Um, and to be a fellow Baptist pastor, they're all five Ds. We're gonna do a little alliteration here. Uh, first off is doctrine, and I'll do these quickly, right? That some people think that uh, they hold a doctrine of the church and the mission of the church and the quote, spirituality of the church that says the church has a spiritual mission and that spiritual mission is defined as something distinct from what we're talking about in terms of public discourse and politics and so on. I think that's an error. But when Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, um, make disciples, how? Baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. He brings our political lives under his lordship. He brings our political lives under the ethics of the kingdom. He brings our political lives under his own control. 
And those lives are not to be lived in some bifurcated schizophrenic way. So that doctrinal approach, I think, has produced some of that tension. The second D is, is distraction, right? So some pastors fear a kind of distraction. Paul says, do not be engaged, do not be entangled with civilian affairs. I do think they overread that text to mean, then therefore we don't do things like politics or talk about politics because it's gonna be distracting. There are some folks who think that to discuss these things from the pulpit is inherently divisive. They're concerned about a 1 Corinthians 1 kind of problem. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of the elephant, I'm of the donkey, I'm of the independent, and so on. It, it need not be that way, right? What Paul does in response to that problem in 1 Corinthians 1 is not say don't talk about it, but to push people deeper into Christ, to make Christ greater, to say who is Paul, who is Apollos, who are Republicans, who are Democrats? Nothing. Christ is all. And, and what has our Lord and Commander called us to do in these things? I, I think part of the tension, too, comes from dishonesty. Just the fundamental dishonesty in some pulpits. I, I, I think about the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah twenty two seventeen. 17. He's drawn a distinction between a previous king who was righteous and did justice and the kings he's addressing at that, at that point. And he says, you have eyes and heart only for your dishonest gain for shedding innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence. Y'all know that there are some pulpits that are dishonest, that there are pastors who preach for selfish gain, and that there are pulpits that would be content with oppression and injustice because it benefits them. Uh, we gotta tell the truth about that. And then finally, there's a kind of dissimulation, a kind of hiding of your true feelings that's unhelpful. And here I'm thinking 2 Corinthians 6, 11 and 12, when Paul appeals to the Corinthians, he says there, we've spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. I, I actually have come to believe that there's a way in which we certainly need to be nonpartisan in the way that Dr. McMickle and Dr. Rivers and others have spoken about. And there's a wide difference between partisanship and politics in the way that we are talking about here. And so in that sense, I don't know that it's helpful for pastors to be endorsing anybody or things of that sort. But I do think it's unhelpful if the pastor doesn't actually model in, in his or her preaching and teaching a way of thinking biblically, of reasoning biblically, and laying that thinking to bear so that the people can evaluate it. So that they know when I'm in the book and when I just sort of stepped off to the side with my own thinking. And so that they are able to discern right from wrong and to chew the fish and spit out the bones and um, to make up their own minds. So that their own consciences are bound not by their news pundits that they watch, but are bound by the word of God. So we're trying to form people in the act of preaching. We're trying to teach them until, as Paul says, Christ is formed in them. And I think in this area where we have refused to lay our thinking to bear and to help people reason morally and to extend that moral reason into justice and action and politics, we're leaving our people malformed and we're leaving them prey to a lot of other voices that are not Christ's voices. And so I hope our pulpits are less feeling less tension about this because in this era, we we need a thunderous prophetic pulpit in the age in which we are now blessed to live. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, and a, no, a number of you have touched on this. And keep the questions coming in. I see them. A number of you have touched on this. And so I want to tabernacle on this question and just kind of flesh it out for a second. We've all observed this phenomenon that we've given voice to. Discourses of orthodoxy kind of laid down beside particular candidates or particular parties. Real Christians do this. Fake Christians do that. What's up with that? Why is that wrong? What's the temptation there? And, and as has been shared, right, we feel, we understand when people come close to that. There were, there were a lot of sermons during this past electoral season that came close to, I can't tell y'all what to do, but we know what we gotta do, yeah. <laughs> right? On both sides though, yeah, yeah. on both sides. 
So how do we talk about that in a, in a faithful way? And what, what are some of the resources and methodologies of, of, of getting our, our point across in ways that do or do not transgress particular lines that you may or may not hold there? Well, just real quickly, um, first, not everything needs to happen in the pulpit, mm -hmm. right? So uh, there may be a sense in which people have an, a, a, an exaggerated import, uh, importance and centrality of the pulpit. Not all the teaching that we do has to be behind the sacred desk. So some of this conversation, I think, is really appropriate to sort of break out into forums in the life of the church, uh, panels of members and things of that sort. So, so part of it is to at least as one pastor, I, I want to, as best I can, keep clear the distinction between thus saith the Lord and thus wrestleth the people, right? Because the Lord says some things really clearly that we got to wrestle with in terms of how we apply it or how we understand it. And I don't want to short circuit that process in the life of my people. So I, I want to try and find places where we can do that. And for me, that often means outside of the pulpit. Um, in the pulpit, I, I want to try to be kind of faithful to three things as best I'm able. I, I want to be faithful to the Word of God. Um, Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, it's required of stewards that we be found faithful, right? That, that's the measuring line. So I want to divide it as best I can, line upon line, precept upon precept. I want to be faithful to the church, meaning the, the sort of new covenant, new humanity people of God, right? So that... Um, I am trying to keep in mind that the people of God are, are not, it, it doesn't map solely over one ethnic people or one political people, uh, but gathers them all. And what does that new humanity look like and, and how does it live out its faith? And then I want to be faithful to the marginalized and the oppressed. Proverbs 31, 8, 9, I want to speak up for those who are vulnerable and distressed. Um, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, that the weightier matters of the law are, are justice and, and steadfastness and so on. And so I, I want to lean toward caring for those that the Lord cares for uh, and privileging those that the Lord privileges beneath his word, keeping in mind who we are as the people of God and finding various places for us to work out the tensions that, that are there. I think the Bible's clear, but I don't think it's easy to obey everything it, it commands. And I think the Bible's clear, but it's not a political program in, in the sense of here's 10 points of a party or, or what have you. Um, and so I, I want us to not do violence to the Bible by making it something that it's not, using proof text to bind consciences, but rather, again, form a kind of Christian uh, who's able to reason deeply and prayerfully from the scriptures out to life. Great, thank you. Anybody else on that? Only to say, I think it would be a mistake if we did not help people understand Article 6 of the United States Constitution. He said Article 6. Article, for those six. Article 6. Article 6. That says there should not be any religious test that is imposed upon a candidate for political office. I've been in many forums where pastors have asked candidates their views about baptism <laughs> or about salvation or about some other not even broadly theological topic, but something that is more denominational in nature. And then it forces candidates to lie mm. or to get twisted into trying to answer a question that they know they're never going to deal with on the other side of the election. So it's important for us to understand, can I, in Cleveland, where I'm living now, one of the big debates is whether or not a mayoral candidate who is a Sunni Muslim, African-American Sunni Muslim, should be supported by black African-American Christians. Well, to the extent that this person's political agenda, the things about which he is campaigning, gravitate toward issues of justice, housing, access to employment, access to uh, quality education, access to putting some limits on police brutality, to the extent that he is advocating for those things and self-declared Christians who are running are advocating for things wholly and completely different than that, mute on those issues. I think Article 6 gives us a way to talk about how to go forward. We're not electing a pope or a pastor. We are electing a mayor or a congressperson uh, and uh, the degree to which they may need some guidance, biblically or theologically. We can provide that. But I'm not going to 
let Article 6 go unspoken uh, because, you know, you can, you can try to impose on candidates an agenda that is not naturally theirs, particularly Muslim candidates, Jewish candidates, or non-believing candidates. So I would just want to insert the importance of, of that article to the Constitution. So it seems to me that um, you know this last election, your question about how do we deal with real Christians do this or real Christians do the opposite, it really challenged us very profoundly to believe what you just said, that Christianity isn't limited to any single party or to any single uh, race or ethnicity. And that we have to, and, and I think this really is a profound challenge, I mean, I don't say this lightly, to really believe that Christ is being formed in all of us and that all of us have to approach this then with great humility and with compassion and love, recognizing that none of us gets it perfectly right. None of us gets it perfectly right. And so to say the only way to be a Christian is to hold the political views I do is antithetical to the gospel teaching, which is that we are all part of one body. And so it calls for great love uh, and great compassion and humility for us to say, this is biblical teaching and here is how I understand the point of wrestling with what that biblical teaching looks like when manifested in the world. And the fact that so many Christians then end up being a single issue voter. I will only vote for someone who uh, is pro-life. Or I will only vote for someone who is African American. Rarely are we given that choice. But if there's an African American in the race, I'm going to vote for that person regardless of their political views. So I, I think it really calls for humility. And as you are rightly saying, that really has to start in the pulpit, that we have to start as pastors who are teaching to say to people, we, we are all brothers and sisters purchased by the blood of Christ and all imperfect, and we're all going to make mistakes, even when in our gut we are convinced wholeheartedly that the person is absolutely 100% wrong, as I frequently am when I look at certain Christians. <laughs> well said, well said, well said. Dr. Pierce? So it, I will say um, simply this. It is an honor to sit on this panel with um, these particular panelists who have such a keen and astute and scholarly and loving approach to the um, question. Um, so I preface that um, to simply say, I really struggle with this. Let me just be honest. I really struggle with this. I have been in settings and environments where this question is on the table and where I have had the challenge of what does it mean for me to call myself a Christian and a follower of Christ and for the white supremacists to say the same thing? Let's, let's just be honest. Let, there, there are real people here. There are real issues at stake. There's something at stake when we have these conversations. And I'm really challenged by them. I'm challenged to, to really sit with, in fellowship, the very people who want me to be silent, who don't want me to have a voice, who don't want me to have a vote. And so, but also say, but we're Christians together. Um, so I put that on the table because we have to deal with these issues in a very real and concrete way. And I'm a scholar and I can give you a scholarly answer, but sitting on this panel today, I'm gonna tell you I'm challenged to be in community with some folk. And it is nothing but the blood of Jesus that keeps me trying day day after day after day to have conversations. Um, so I will simply say this, I recognize in utter humility, I don't have a heaven or a hell to put someone in. And so therefore I cannot make judgments about what they say that they are and who they say that they are. But I will say this with all of my being, that if we are going to have 
honest conversations about what it means to be engaged believers, and we put on the table the things that I know are absolutely oppositional to what it means to love and care for one another, I'm going to say something about that. And it is not my attempt to judge you or to send you to hell or to send you to heaven, but it is to say that we can't pretend like there aren't real people on the other side of some of these conversations and decisions that are being made. And so you might believe in God, but then you vote in ways that demonstrate to me, and then you campaign in ways, and then you talk and live in ways that are harmful, then I have to say something about that. So I, I just, I want to say that I agree with everything that was said, but I also want to speak for the people who are challenged to do this in real time. Some Someone who denies my humanity might still call himself or herself a Christian. I also don't have to continue to be in conversation with them. Uh, I, I really want to uh, build on that because I think that that's a profound point. Because I think the other thing that we have as Christians, in addition to the call to be compassionate and humble, is to hold each other accountable. When Peter refused to eat uh, with Gentile Christians. Paul challenged him. And so I agree wholeheartedly with Dean Paris that we ought to be challenging Christians who are falling short of the biblical mandate. The fact that we are compassionate in dealing with them and that we don't, uh, and, and that we are humble in terms of recognizing our own limitations does not mean that we should not hold people accountable. I think Paul is also very hard about actually not even fellowshipping with people who are clearly violating the Christian lifestyle. So, and Jesus says that we will know them by their fruit. So I don't want to say that we assume that anybody who gets up and says, I'm a Christian, but I can kill babies, that that person is necessarily a Christian. Or I'm a Christian, but I can... Uh, support white supremacists. White supremacy is a Christian. I don't want to trivialize it and suggest that. I think that this is something which really is something we have to wrestle with, something we have to struggle with and really be in prayer about. Uh, writing off large swaths of people, I think, is what I'm concerned about. But absolutely, 100%, we need to challenge people and hold them accountable to live out the biblical mandate and to focus on those who God has prioritized, and that is those who are disadvantaged, those who are oppressed, those are, who are downtrodden. Most black people fall in that category. Those who are poor, he calls us, God calls us to have special care for them, and we ought to be holding each other accountable for living that out. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I want you all to weigh in. I just want to add one little spice here because I think this is a very important conversation. This, I did say spice. Um, um, <laughs> y'all got me off uh, topic. Um, because it, 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 it has been the case. I think one of the things that we're talking about is the, the contestation between different, ver different articulations of, there have been plural Christianities in America. That's right. That's right. And different espousings of what is the faith. And part of this conversation includes that because people are contending for their own brands, versions, conceptions of what Christianity is. And that's a very historical conversation. Goes back to early 1890s, goes back to early American uh, uh, conversations and realities, but that's a part of this. And we have to, how do we navigate that? As this, That's a part of the conversation that we're having now. I, I love this conversation. I'm so thankful for you putting that on the table in a very real way because it, even in this room, I know that there's some of you are sitting out there thinking, I'm going to a different church this Sunday, right? And some of you are struggling with, I'm going to stay where I am even though I'm facing these things, and you have a sense of conviction about that, and you're wanting to fight for unity and other things. And this is why I think how we shape the conscience is really important because I don't think every Christian has to respond the same way to this challenge. Some of you are in churches, you need to leave, and it's okay to leave, and you need someone to tell you that it's okay to leave. Because if that rascal's in the pulpit espousing explicitly or in a veiled way white supremacy, you don't need to sit under that, Amen. right? You're not obligated to sit under that. 
Sometimes leaving is healthy. But some of you are in churches with good pastors who are swimming in the eddies and the undertoes and the, and the flood of this present moment, doing the best they can, fumbling sometimes, sometimes getting stuff a little bit right. They didn't go as far as you wanted them to, and so you mad. You probably need to stay and support that pastor. Because that pastor right now, if he needs anything or she needs anything, is courage and encouragement. Now, I think it's by Christ's design on the strength of 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 14 and a lot of passages that he takes all us different people and put them in one body. And I think it's part of his providential design that all these burrs and sharp points that we have to ourselves and that other people have to themselves is for our sanctification. So one of the reasons that you may need to stay, may need to stay, is that you might be challenged by someone else who holds a different view, who sees your sin or sees my sin better than we see it. You need that person. I need that person. How else are we going to be sanctified? Because here's the truth, too. Most of our pastors don't preach to the particular sins of their particular people. They preach about the sins of other people. Right? So if there's no confrontation, and if we continue what we've been doing over the last 10 years of this sort of giant resort of Christians into churches that fit their flavor and variety, it's hardly a week that goes by when I'm not talking to a pastor who says, man, in the last two years I've lost 30% of my congregation over this issue or that issue, and they are resorting into the church that has their own particular political flavor. If we, if we continue to do that, we will be short-circuiting the prophetic challenge and the, the sanctification that I think the Lord means to do to us as a church in this moment. So I guess my plea to pastors is have some courage. Preach the word, flat-footed full-throated. Let the word do the work. Study your people and realize you're not preaching to your podcast, you're not preaching to Twitter, but you're preaching to your people and challenge your people to come up in Christ and challenge the sins of your particular people. So just as an illustration, not because we're great at this, but we're having to learn to do this. Um, my sister talked rightly about black and brown folk catching it right now, being the, the most frequently marginalized, oppressed folks. I'm in a, in a, in a, in a part of the, the city that's 94% African American. My church is predominantly African American. We got a smattering of some diversity there. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a rise in anti-Asian racism. Well, I didn't think, our pastors didn't think we needed to sort of just let that go because that's not our issue. We've got maybe three or four Asian American brothers and sisters who are part of our church. It's like, no, actually, we need to speak into this because guess what? Black folk got some problematic and sinful attitudes toward Asian people too. No, no. Because we catch that doesn't mean we're exempt from it. And so we address our congregation. We say, hey, we know some of y'all went to the corner store and you still mad 15 years ago because this person did something in the corner store. We, we got to address that in various ways. And so a pastoral letter or pastoral comments or in a sermon. So I, that's a long winded way of Stephen. I, I want to, I'm in a complete agreement with what everyone has said. And I just want to appeal to folks out there who are likewise struggling to stay at the table to say, you're free in Christ. You know, don't sin against your conscience. If you feel like you need to leave, leave. If you feel like you need to stay, stay. Support the courageous pastors that you have and, and know that the Lord is at work in the midst of all of this to sanctify us and to grow us. It hurts sometimes to be sanctified. And, and it challenges our faith sometimes to stay on the potter's wheel. But the Lord's good and yeah. he's at work. Let me, if I could just build on all of these last comments, but especially the, the notion of courage and the story of Peter and Paul and the Gentiles. So Peter was enjoying himself with the Gentiles. That's right. That's right. 
Paul wasn't the problem. James was the problem. When, when James and the other Christians came from Jerusalem, suddenly Peter caught himself between his past and his future. Am I going to go back to the limitations in which I had been living until now? Or am I going to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free? My future. I think, I think many pastors have to outgrow who they were as they were being formed in their early years the Sunday school lessons they heard, the sermons they heard, the values they heard in their early years and, and move into a new liberty. And what Paul, I think, was rebuking Peter for was, having, was lacking the courage to do that. You're here, you're with them, I've seen you. Suddenly, because the old has come back, you find yourself withdrawing. And I, I find a lot of my clergy colleagues over the decades have struggled with moving into liberation theology, moving into justice-based ministries, moving into women in ministry, moving into the affirmation of the LGBTQ community. Because while they want to go out into the new, there's somebody, there's some James back there that they are afraid to, uh, to disappoint. And so this word courage, I think, is so important. Can you be an effective pastor, particularly in an African-American congregation, particularly given the issues that we face today, if you are a pulpit coward? If you, if you do not have courageous conversations? I don't think you can. And uh, I, I want to thank all of you for helping to kind of bring me to this observation. Let me, let me frame a question around this. So, uh, Dr. Rivers, if you want to respond to that, you, this question will be in line with that. Um, and then after this question, we'll go to our audience question. Keep sending those in. Um, so th there was a, a debate I saw, this was in 2016, between, it was between Eddie Glaude and Michael Eric Dyson. How you feel about two of them is not the point of this question. <laughs> Who was the first person? Eddie Glaude, oh, Eddie Glaude. Michael Eric Dyson. Um, one of the things they were talking about, though, is this notion that the black community is a captured ele electorate. And they were debating whether, during the 2016 election, presidential election, whether it was prudential for the black community to try to nuance itself, given what was at, what was at stake in the 2016 election, however you situated yourself politically. And they disagreed on that, on that point. About a month later, 538 article came out that basically says, you know, black issues that are of concerning to black communities go unheard because they're a capture elect electorate. And when I was reflecting on that um, commentary, it stands to reason then if, if the black community is by and large a capital elect electorate, then the black church itself is a captured electorate. And what ways then can black Christians in particular nuance themselves and push back against perhaps ideological conservatism and ideological progressivism and not sit in the status of being, you know, the assumption is very clear. Well, we know what y'all gonna do. So, so there's that. All of what we've heard up here so far has been conversations about complexities, nuancing, what should be the main thing, how to address such and such. But given that reality of the fact that the demographics and the percentages, the voting patterns are what they are. How, how can we encourage black Christians to, to push back against kind of safely sitting on one side or the other? What, where's the pushback? And what are the resources that we marshal to, to inform our pushback against those two extremes? So I do want to build on this idea of courage because I think core to being a Christian is that we are countercultural. We do not reflect the culture around us. We are salt and light in the middle of it. And I think, unfortunately, we don't always have the courage to do that. And I think that that's as much a challenge for pastors. So some of the questions that uh, you raised, for example, welcoming the LGBT community into the church. We absolutely should. We're Christians. We are called to love everyone. Should we accept as biblical 
the LGBTQ lifestyle, I think there are strong biblical passages that suggest this is an area where we ought to be countercultural. That we ought to stand on the fact that Jesus said himself, God created them male and female. That he takes the position that the notion of biblical understanding of gender and of marriage is not what is currently acceptable in the culture and that we should lovingly, compassionately, and humbly be true to the biblical mandate. And that is something that I think there are reasons, apart from losing your congregation, apart from alienating youth, which none of us in the church wants to do. You see my gray hairs, you know I'm well old. Uh, we don't want to alienate the youth, but we have got to be true to the word of God, whatever the price may be. And I think that that is very difficult for pastors. In addition to the fact, you also pointed out that a lot of pastors are tempted to preach for gain. There's a lot of money behind going along with the LGBTQ position. There's a lot of money attached to that, and there's a lot of money to be lost if you stand on the biblical mandate. So I think what we ought to do, really as an act of faith, and being prepared to pay the price, is to challenge progressive politics where they fly in the face of the biblical position, and to challenge conservative politics in the same way. How dare you turn your back on the poor? How dare you oppress people when that is something Jesus talked about far more than he ever talked about sexuality? How dare you as Christians do this? Our charge is to stand firm regardless of the price and to be able to say, I stand with you on this because you fit the biblical mandate. And I stand with you on this because you fit the ma biblical mandate, and I will challenge you wherever you deviate from it. Gosh, I really, I, I really, um, I really have to take a different position. Mm, I, I'm flabbergasted that I'm in delighted. the 21st century, we're reading scripture through a first century lens with no appreciation for hermeneutics, no appreciation for contextuality, no appreciation for the fact that in Leviticus 18, where some people talk about, you know, human sexuality, there's a dozen things in the 10th century BC holiness code uh, beyond Leviticus 18.22 that people have long since left behind. There are, there are a dozen things that Paul lists in Romans chapter one beside male and female, men with men, women with women, that we just don't even talk about. There are lots of things in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, I, I, I'm always intrigued that that becomes the topic around which the decision is made as to whether or not somebody is biblically faithful. I, I just finished a book called Let the Oppressed Go Free, based upon uh, Isaiah 58 and Luke chapter 4. And it is sort of an evolution of liberation theology from black theology to liberation theology around poverty issues in Latin America to feminist theology, womanist theology, LGBTQ, queer theology, their term, not mine, uh, Native American sovereignty religion, and then moving, though the book didn't come out in time for it, uh, into Asian American liberation theology. I think this is where a courageous conversation is required, not a conclusion. But I could not disagree with you more on that last point, and that's the point about which I think the church has yet to have a courageous conversation. We take a position, we're hardened on the left, we're hardened on the right. Uh, in the middle, um, you know, the people who are uh, in the LGBTQ community are they there because they've chosen to be there behaviorally? Are they there because they perceive themselves birthed there biologically? I don't know. But I'm not prepared to say that it is unbiblical to be where they are. I'm just not prepared to, 
take that position. What's up everyone, Lisa Fields here, and I'm so excited about our new curriculum, Courageous Conversations. You heard about our popular conference, Courageous Conversations, where we invite the leading pastors, thought leaders, and scholars from conservative and progressive backgrounds for conversations. But we not only want to have those conversations on stage at the conference, but we want you to have them in your everyday life. So we developed a curriculum for you to do just that. Courageous Conversations curriculum, the tools you need for the conversations and culture. You can get that today on Amazon or on our website at ju3project.org. This is important. I I don't want to cut you off. We're we're, going to stay right here. We're going to tabernacle right here. I see the questions. I do see y'all's questions, but I want to let this play out because this, I mean, y'all came here. Y'all might as well. Y'all paid the money. Might as well have the conversation, right? So I see the questions. We're going to move into questions, but I, I, I want to see where this goes. I'm watching like y'all. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I wanted to come firmly back to your question because your question um, was about these public debates about African Americans as a voting block, right? And, and here's where I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us because we often make assumptions that the folk don't think or don't haven't thought about things critically. And I have to challenge us on that. I was raised in a tiny little storefront church. There was a man at that storefront church who for the the years of my childhood, every single Monday would take a bus from the church to a prison in New York City. Some of you would know where this is, right? and I remember when I was older and returned back to that, to that church, um, I had a conversation with this, with this elder. And he had a son at that prison. The son eventually died. But his faithfulness, week after week, rain, sleet, snow, to drive a little 15-passenger van, primarily made up of, in terms of passengers, black women, who are going to see their sons at this particular prison. I share this story because we now have returning citizens ministries. We we now have prison ministries. He didn't have the terminology for what he was doing. What he said that he was doing, he said it to me, literally, and I can still hear his words echoing in my ear. He said, these mamas need to love on their sons. I share that story because our grandparents, our parents, our elders, our aunties, our uncles in our community aren't just a voting block. They're not just saying, oh, well, this is what I've always done. Stop thinking that people are not critically engaged because they don't use the language that you use. They have thought through the decisions that they're going to make. They have thought through. There is some grandmother somewhere right now who is contemplating voting for a candidate because it turns out that her granddaughter is trans and she loves her granddaughter and she is going to vote for the person who supports her granddaughter having the fullness of her humanity, whether or not her theology agrees with it. What I'm trying to say is that people make complicated decisions and you don't have to be seminary or divinity school educated, PhD educated, to be able to think through the meeting place of your theology and your justice. And so we have to stop assuming that people are voting in a block simply because that's what they've always done or because they've, but people are really giving thought and, and we have to stop assuming that folk just go to the, to the polls or folks just go to church and they hear some of these things and that they don't agree, right? And so there are going to be people who will hear messages and they will not agree with that message. They will not agree with any kinds of restrictions that seek to take away the freedoms and the liberations of any person, person made in the image and likeness of God. I have to sit in a church where I keep hearing people refer to God as he. That doesn't fit with my own personal theology, but I affirm that there are people for whom that is the way that they know God. That doesn't make me wrong or them wrong, but we can be in fellowship with one another. So all I'm trying to say is, is that we can't look at a voting block and make the assumption that someone is just basically not thinking. We have lots of 
thinking people who have thought through their ideology, their theology, and their politics. And just because it doesn't sound the way that it sounds when we have a conversation, we have to stop assuming that our elders, our grandparents, the folks in our neighborhoods and our communities know any less that we need to humble ourselves about that. Years ago, Clifton Johnson wrote a book called God Struck Me Dead. It's a collection of conversion testimonies from folks who were formerly enslaved. Um, there's, there's almost no sophistication in the testimonies. There's a whole lot of God and a whole lot of theology. And I think often we're closer to the book when we are listening to the folk than we are when we're listening to you know, the scholarly and the erudite with 16 degrees or the professional pulpiteer like myself. And so I, I think that's right. I, it, the, the question on progressive conservative, I want to exhort you to lose the labels and keep the Bible. That neither progressive or conservative are in the Bible. These are themselves worldly framings. These are themselves secular framings uh, under which travel a lot of ideas, some of which you might agree with, some of which you might disagree with. I, I think the Christians should find themselves in the uneasy position of saying, or maybe the easy position of saying, there's some ways I'm conservative, there's some ways I'm progressive. Depends on what you're talking about. Absolutely. Depends on what you're talking about. And, and what determines whether I am progressive or conservative is, what does say of the Lord? What does say of the Lord? I, Leviticus 18, my brother referred to, starts this way. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, countercultural, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, still countercultural, where you're going, the land to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes Preach. and walk in them. I am the Lord, your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them, and I am the Lord. Now, there's a lot to wrestle with in what he commands in Leviticus 18. But what we should not be wrestling with is the fact that he's God and we're not, that he's our creator, we're the creature, and that therefore means he owns us. And that the way in which we were meant to operate, to live, is not according to what we think, but according to what God says. If you lose the Bible, you're going to lose your way. It's a complex but if time. You, but if so you just, select just to fin the verses just to that finish, you want. Just to finish my comment. Just to finish my comment. It's a complex time we live in with lots of questions. And I just want to exhort us to say, you know, let's have some humility before the questions. Let's recognize the folk have thought about these things and they're things for us to learn from one another. Let's bring it all under the book. God is still speaking and he wants to speak in these conversations. And it is not humble, it is hubris to do one of two things. To say that I've got this figured out and I don't need to hear what God has said. Or, beloved, it's a different kind of pride to give final authority to our questions rather than to God's declarations. Mm -hmm. we, we have to doubt our doubts. We have to question our questions, and we got to do that with our books open, with the Bible open. But you also have to acknowledge the places where the text is silent. A amen. Because there are amen. many issues around which the text is silent. And there are also many different issues that have multiple interpretations. So people talk about a biblical mandate of marriage. Do you know how many kinds of marriages there are in the biblical text? What we need to be able to do is have these conversations in context understanding and respecting the context in which it was written 
which is vastly different than our own. It doesn't mean that it does not then have meat for us today, but it also recognizes the fact that in the time and the place, in the situation in which it was written, may not be our time and place in our situation. None of us are selling our 12-year-old daughters into marriage, right? So we have to understand the text in its context. God is still moving and God is still speaking. That doesn't mean, though, that we're only confined to the words of the text. Don't let the text be your God. That's the thing we cannot do. The because when we do that, then we simply say, well, when something is absent, nu nuclear war is absent. War is not absent in the text, right? There are all kinds of things that are absent. What do we do? How do we engage? We do that with one another. Mm -hmm. We do that with taking seriously a hermeneutical lens that is shaped by understanding the context of the text itself. Yeah, I'm only raising my mic to eagerly agree with you. I, I hope, no, no, I hope I, nothing I've said is oh, no, no, no. And, and we are agreeing. The, the process but, but of conversation. It, it is, but, I, but this, is, this is why we're having this conversation because we want it to be easy and it's not easy. Right? We, we want, everybody wants it to be like, thou shall not, thou shall, thou shall not, thou shall. Be, because that's easy. Black, white, don't do this, do this, do that. What happens when there is no mandate, where there is no text, when you are facing life circumstances and you can't find a passage in verse? So my grandmother would say, this is when you need to know that you know, that when you have an interior relationship with God, when you have been infused with the Holy Spirit, even if you can't find that particular circumstance in the scriptural text, you have someone you can go to in prayer so that we have a way forward, even if it is not explicitly named in the text. But, yeah. We it, have but to. But it's so important that where the Bible speaks speaks clearly, speaks repeatedly, not just in Leviticus, because clearly Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, and so we are no longer offering animal sacrifices. Any number of things that are outlined in the Pentateuch, we no longer practice because he has fulfilled it. But when he comes back again, not just in Leviticus, but it comes back again in Jesus' own words, it comes back again in Paul. When there's a clear principle, then we need to live in line with that principle. And what, what I see, what seems to happen is that I, I think of the head of Bank of America, Chad Gifford, a wealthy man in Boston, who became completely on board with the position of gay marriage because Someone in his family was gay. Look, how many black women are called, especially Christian women, to live a celibate life because they're going to be consistent with the biblical teaching that sex belongs inside of a committed married relationship and because there is not a man whom they have fallen in love with or whom they have married for whatever reason. And so they're going to be true to the biblical mandate. It's a painful position to say that if you were born, because I, I don't know the source of homosexual leanings, I don't pretend to know. I know that uh, the research tends to indicate that it may in fact be uh, something that people are born with. How painful to have to live that way your entire life. Yet, there are people born because of sin that exists in, in the world. There, there are people born without arms and legs. They have to live with those limitations. There are some things in our lives we stand on principle. As much as our hearts bleed for those who carry those heavy burdens, we stand on the word. We stand on what God has said. And that is essential for us to do. It is essential for us as Christians because without the word, if the Bible isn't true, we should just, as Paul said, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. If it isn't true, we're just fooling ourselves. Dr. Mikko, I'm going to let you respond. I'm going to highlight a question so it at least look like I still have control up here. <laughs> um, but I, I want you to, re to respond. Does anybody see, everybody see that question highlighted around you? So I'm gonna go my, into a yeah. question right after Dr. McBickle responds. My, my, my long standing frustration 
has been with selective exegesis. And with the things that we choose to enforce and the things that we just pass over in the text, the same text. So Romans 1, which is Paul, okay, just is right after he talks about men with men and women with women. To the extent that persons who are committed to that remain equally committed to preaching publicly and holding forth boldly on the rest of this, beginning on verse 29. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. My point is simple. To the extent that all of that is elevated to the level of urgency, with which some people want to elevate the first part of that passage and ignore in their preaching and in the people in their churches publicly, knowingly engaging in all of these things, including the preacher himself or herself. I want to know the preacher who is free of envy, greed, strife, malice, gossip, slander, arrogance, Boastful. So, yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be content with the discussion that singles out LGBTQ issues based upon the reading of a passage up to the comma. And on the other side of the comma, there are a dozen other matters that I can't draw folks into a discussion about, in part because they're guilty of so many of those things. As you were saying earlier, uh, they don't want to preach about the things in which they are engaged. If they happen not to be LGBTQ themselves, oh, I'm at liberty to throw down on that. But arrogance and boastful and greedy and yeah. So yeah, let's read the whole Bible. You know, so, if you're gonna read the Bible, so, let's read all of it. So let me let me frame it with a question from the audience because I think it fits and then we can we can continue. But I do want us to Never mind. We, I'm going to just frame it with a question from, from the audience. <laughs> Thank you, for that. We, we'll but be I, brief. We'll be brief. <laughs> um, because this, this I, think, I think it fits. What, what, what we see and know, the complexity is very, very apparent. And because people in the pews on the ground are thinking critically about these things, are having these conversations, we're modeling one up here. How, how do we come alongside people and, and wrestle with these complexities? What resources do we, do we marshal? How do we help People think, particularly from the pulpit. You know, you, you, all of us have seen from the pulpit individuals address things in helpful ways, and individuals reflect that they clearly have not, right? They don't, they're, they're not an expert on an issue and do great damage. So, how do we help people wrestle with the complexity, whether on this particular site of a of a conversation or a whole host of other issues? Yep. Um, I, I hope what folks know, I'm sure, because Lisa does a wonderful job with this, with these conferences, and we praise God for you, sister, and your Amen. ministry to um, the church as a whole. Amen. Yeah. I, I hope that as you're watching this, part of what you're getting is an attempt up here to model how to have conversations where there are differences. And Dr. McMichael is right. One of the differences that you're seeing sort of expressed right now is a difference with regard to hermeneutics and how we approach the text. And sometimes we need to have that conversation before we have the conversation about the subject, right? So that, that's at play here. We don't have time to do all that, but that's at play here. Um, my response to your frustration in response to your question is, I think we do ourselves great help as, as preachers if we in fact commit ourselves to sequential exposition of the text. That's what keeps me from cherry picking. That's what keeps me from my hobby horses. That's what keeps me going past the comma to the period. But it's also what helps me understand that in this chapter, in this chapter, Paul spent two paragraphs on um, homosexuality, right? In this chapter, that's where he put the weight. But he doesn't do that in 1 Corinthians 6. It's just one in a list. 
So if my commitment to preaching the text and preaching it sequential and expounding the argument that's in the text rather than slyly putting my argument and my perspective in there, that's part of the safeguard. Mm-hmm. to that. That's part of what keeps us from this, what you've called selective exegesis, which I agree can be a problem. Now, the other thing I would want to say, though, is particularly as a pastor and a preacher of the scripture, I want my people to have confidence in the Bible. Yes. I, I want to preach in such a way that I convey that they can trust God's word. Yes. That the fact that we wrestle with texts and the text is silent on some things, very true doesn't mean that therefore we walk away questioning and rejecting the text. God has told us what he wanted us to know. And it's sufficient. Now that doesn't mean you just point the text and all the work is done. You got to keep thinking. You got to keep wrestling. But you got to do that, I think, both standing on the text and beneath the text. On the text as your foundation. This is the rock. All of the ground is sinking sand. And beneath the text, because Jesus is Lord, because God is our creator. And we've got to sort of strike that balance. And so there's a hermeneutic discussion to have. There are issues about hobby horses and all of that. But I want to commit, I want to encourage us to trust the book and study the book line upon line, precept upon precept, learn about hermeneutics, talk with folks who differ. Romans 14, accept one another, not to doubtful disputations. We spend a lot of time arguing about things about things the Bible doesn't speak to very clearly, and about issues that really, you know, are matters of conscience. But we we don't spend enough time. Actually, I'm troubled by the clear parts. I'm troubled by the clear yes. parts. Yes. The clear parts are enough to occupy the rest of my life. Yeah. And so we need to get under the book. <laughs> I, and I, I want to build on that and say, I think I agree with you. I think one of the things that we have failed at in the church is to hold heterosexuals to the kind of standard that we ought to. So the pastor is doing what he's doing, sexual, all kinds of sexual sin, and there is not, nobody is holding him accountable. Or even if he's caught, what happens? He's transferred to another church, maybe even a bigger church, How wrong is that? And I I agree with you. Whenever I stand in the pulpit, I try to make sure that I confess my sins. You ask anybody who's heard me preach, I confess to pride, one of my big sins. And these days, I've also recognized envy. I grapple with those things. That's what I spend my time praying about. The other thing I would say is important for our conversations is that when we read the Bible, we ought to be reading cover to cover. So that we are not overwhelmed by what's out here in the culture and what seems to be the big issues, but we're seeing for ourselves that, for example, Jesus is much more interested in justice for the poor than he is in these sexual issues. So I think you are absolutely right. We should not be uh, 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 putting disproportionate emphasis on these things and that we ought to be even-handed in how we deal with it so that we are holding everyone to the same standard, and that when we're in conversation with one another, we're listening, we're humble, and we're courageous. Dr. Pierce. So, um, again, I I love this idea that we're modeling a conversation that is um, very, very difficult to have, um, because there would be so many points of disagreement I would have. I am cognizant that there are real people here. People want to have conversations about the text. I want to have a conversation about James. I want to have a conversation about Bob. They're real people. And they're real people who have experienced so much hurt and pain at the hands of churches and at the hands of people who claim to be Christians. So I simply want to say, I speak for all of you who might be here or might be listening who have doubts, who struggle, who understand that the text isn't as clear as you think that it is clear. For the slaveholders, the text was very clear. We always have to be more humble about what we claim that we read, that we think that we understand. Paul talks about how we see through a glass dimly. We just have a limited understanding. We're gonna do the best that we can. 
but there are real people here, real pains, real hurts, real situations, right? And I have to live in community with real people. And I have to love them. And I have to love them with the love that Christ has loved me. Right, And that means sometimes, even if I don't understand it, even if I doubt it, even if I struggle with it, I still have to be in community and loving people. And so perhaps for, for myself, and I, and I can't speak for Dr. McNichol, but I'm an educator. I want someone to come to my school. I want them to approach the text, all of the text, with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Right? I want them to look and engage and read and, and, and walk away and be angry and be frustrated and come back to it again and read it again and read. Because guess what? The text says something to you different in one season of your life than it does in another season of your life, right? And, and so all of that engagement is important to me. But like I said, there's still real people here. And to the extent to which we inflict pain, to the extent to which we harm people, we have to be accountable for that. To the extent to which we denigrate people's humanity, the extent to which sometimes our pulpits have made it seem as if some people were made in the image and likeness of God, but other people were not, we need to repent from that. We need to rebuke that. And we need to take seriously what it means to have an ethos of care and community for everyone that we encounter. Struggle with the text. Even when you think it's clear, it's less clear than you think it really is. Even when you think it says, this will, this is it. For a long time, people thought people who look like me should be held in bondage in perpetuity because they read the text. So we need to struggle with it, and that's okay. You don't have less faith because you struggle. You have more faith because you want to take seriously what you believe to be the word of God. I'm on this stage to say I take seriously the word of God, and that means that I don't have the answers. But if I treat anyone with less than wholehearted love and care and respect, then I've misunderstood everything that I've read. If I That's just, what we're here to I'm do. Sorry, I'm sorry. Just one final observation that I, that I so much appreciate in this discussion, and that it is, it is a realization a remembering that even the African-American church is not monolithic. You know, we keep talking about the black church and the white church. Well, the white church we know is not monolithic, uh, but neither, neither are we. Half of my family, uh, as I mentioned Maywood to you earlier, co comes from uh, Progressive Church of God in Christ. My uncle James was, uh, was an elder in that church for 44 years sat out the entire civil rights movement. Even when Martin King came to Chicago in 1966, he wouldn't even come to town because in his mind, to be involved in the civil rights movement was contrary to the pursuit of holiness and would pull him out of that pursuit. I, on the other hand, you know, was totally, completely, thoroughly engaged. I spent all my life in that struggle. You know, between that part of my family, Kojic, Pentecostal, charismatic, you know, in pursuit of the holy life, speaking in tongues, and another way of thinking about religion altogether. But I loved them deeply and dearly. Of course, every time we had Thanksgiving dinner and they asked me to pray, they were never sure my prayer was going to get through, so one of them would pray after me, you know, to put the Holy Ghost touch on it. But uh, other than that, we got along uh, perfectly well. Uh, Get that food blessed. You know. uh, <laughs> Let can, me I, can I just say one quick thing, which is I question how sincere the slaveholders' reading of the text was. And I understand that there are all these passages uh, where slavery appears to be endorsed. But they could not have taken the book of Philemon seriously given the way African Americans were treated and uh, enslaved Africans were treated. So just as we have every right to say uh, your, we, Jesus says you are going to, will know you by your fruit, I have to question the fruit and whether this was not simply a convenient use of the text. Let me, let me, oh, uh, sure. let me, let me, let me uh, frame another question. Tell, tell everybody I fought a good fight, okay? <laughs> um, let me, um, I want us to end here because we are, we, are, we are out of time, but I think this is a, a helpful last question. Um, and I'm gonna riff on this uh, question from the audience. 
Um, the question says, could the Lord be leading us to a theology that includes the position of I don't know, which should be a place where we build loving bridges across deeply held difference. I wanna, differences? I want to riff on that as a last question, and everybody can give a short uh, answer, and then we'll, we'll go to our seats. Um, given that the political discussions that we engage in touch people's lives, affects the material conditions, not just black life, but all life. And we want to add the, the kind of moral authority, the weight that comes with the faith that, that, that we carry. We try to, we ostensibly try, we try to carry it uh, 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 well, and we try to do so with, with dignity and, and, and honesty, et cetera. What is it that we want society around us to look like? What's the, what's the tell us of speaking into these things? What does it look like? Because as I was preparing to moderate this morning, I was drawn to passages that talk about praying for kings and, 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 and supplications and, and for all people so that we can live, live a peaceable life. So that our, 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 our status here might be one where the context around us is such that justice and love and equity, et cetera. I, I was just drawn to that because I was, I, I, was, I was asking myself, well, what is it all, what will it look like if our weighing in, if our advocacy, if our speaking into these issues were realized? What would society look like? It's a big question right now because, again, different iterations, conceptions of Christianity in America are advocating for America to look a particular kind of way. What, what does it look like for us? What, what we want it to look like? And I, I, here's my, the footnote. It's not a Christian America in a sense of everybody is forced to adhere to, what, you know, what, right? I, I don't think that's it. So, so, so what is it? What, what does it look like at the end of our advocacy, at the end of our leaning in, engaging? What are the... What, is that, what are the ingredients of that, of that environment? And, 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 and what, what is your aspiration um, as you're doing the work of speaking into these issues? So this is a riff off of a, of a question that, that was asked, but I think it's a good place to land. Yeah. To, to land. Yeah. Dr. McMichael. Um, allow me to riff on that. Sure. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm much, at the moment, I'm much less focused on what the country will look like and much more focused on what the church, as it functions in the country, will look like. So to that extent, I want to go to Isaiah 58. Because Isaiah 58 puts us in a tension between religiosity and righteousness and, and the work of justice. So allow me to just read this. I read this because this is the basis of the book that I was just referring to, where the issue is, why have we fasted and you have not noticed? Shorthand, all of the biblical prophets of the Old Testament were trying to get Israel to not be content with ritual and focus instead, as all of us have said, on matters of justice and caring for the poor and the hungry and ending oppression. So the text says, why have we fasted and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? And then verse six, to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. So my hope is that at some point the church will cease to be a place focused on rituals and religious practices and become a place that is the home to and the, and the training ground for people prepared to do the work of righteousness, which is to care for the poor, the needy, the homeless, the hungry, the marginalized, whoever and wherever they might be. If all we do is go to church and go through the motions of religion, but that does not transform us into persons, to go back 
to the idea of being salt in the earth, light in the world, city on the hill, then what's the point? Then we should just eat and drink and be merry because God is not pleased. That's what Isaiah 58 says to me. Thank you. Doc. So as strong as the calling for justice is throughout the prophets, what is even more profound in my reading is a call for turning away from idolatry. So the first thing that I would commit that we as Christians should be committed to doing is spreading the gospel, bringing people to an understanding of who Jesus is and to an embrace of his salvation and to enter into eternal life. That's our number one mission and number one transformation in the United States and around the world. Close on the heels of that, because he exemplified it by his life, is this question of mercy and justice, of defending the poor, of feeding the hungry, of clothing the naked. Because he says in Matthew 24, I think it is, that we, he's going to, whatever we do for the least of these, we do for him. And at the same time that we're doing it sensitive to the thing that has been a theme throughout all we've said this morning, which is the complexity. So that as I advocate, as Christians around the world advocate for the humanity of unborn babies, and as I say to my beloved daughter, don't turn your back on them because of the pain that it brings women to bring these children into the world. Don't turn your back on them because of the un injustice that women suffer. Don't turn your back on unborn babies. That we embrace the difficulty of standing with women who have unintentional pregnancies. That we provide for them, that we care for them, that we love them that we help them avoid such pregnancies, that we help them carry them to term, that we help them raise the children for 18 years. That is the world that I believe we should be aiming for. Thank you. Dr. Pastor T. Uh, agreeing with all that's been said previously, um, I, I think I'm an, an evangelistic and ecclesiological optimist and an eschatological pessimist. I don't know where the world is going, except that the Bible says that the love of many will grow cold and all kinds of problems, I assume, will persist. But among the people of God, there should be great hope and great joy uh, and great zeal for making the good news known and calling people into the rescue that Christ has accomplished on the cross when he shed his blood for our sins and was raised from the grave three days later for our justification. The righteousness that he provides in place of the absolute unrighteousness. Our filthy rags. That's exactly right. That, that, that we are in our sin. Um, that the church can be that alternative community where we really do take seriously the Imago Day, Where we really do take seriously love. And I think that's a, a word used far too commonly that has lost its, it, the sense of radicalness and costliness that the scripture describes and associates with it. And I think we have lost the sense that love is that is, man, that central animating thing that ought to define this community called Christians. I mean, it's the great commandment. And the second's like it. Not only is the great commandment, it is the, the greatest of virtues. Faith, hope, and love abides. The greatest of these is love. It is not only the, the greatest virtue, it is the sign that we, in fact, we are Christians. John 13, 34, and 35. This is how the world will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. It, it, it ought to be our ethical impulse. I think this is the genius of Dr. King. He understood it far more radically than anybody before or since. Um, so my great hope is that our churches would fight and claw and pray and work and yes, tarry and call upon the Spirit 
who sheds the love of God in their hearts, uh, that we might be communities marked by love in, in what might be an increasingly dark place um, with more and more confusion. The last thing I'd say quickly, at least for my own congregation and to the extent that you guys, I'm not sure you should be listening to me, though I thank Lisa for the invitation and for the honorarium. Um, <laughs> I'm not, you know, we should be thankful, right? I, I, you know, I'm not sure you should be listening to me, but to the extent that, that you are and you do and you put any credence in what I've said, I, I want you to know, with the Apostle Paul, I, I want your faith to rest not on the eloquence of men, but on the power of God. Amen. And in all of this questioning, let your faith rest on God's power. Let your faith rest on God's word. And uh, one thing I know about God is you can bring your questions and your doubts and your struggles to him. He's not going to crush you for doing that. Um, so that's my hope. Dr. Pierce. Um, thank you all. Thank you, colleagues. This has been um, wonderful and amazing. I, I think my, my closing would just simply be that I am grateful that, that there's room for me at God's table. Um, and that the table was not spread by human hands, but there's room for me at God's table. Yes, yes. And for me, I mean, the woman is theologian, pro-choice, LGBT advocate, queer advocate, the, the person who would probably be on the absolute left of every spectrum that you would find, that there is room for me yes. and there's room for all of us. Yes. And so that when I have to give an account, because I believe I will, you will, all of us will have to give an account, I will be able to say that I loved everyone I encountered with the radical love of Christ. And where I have erred, and I'm sure I've made many mistakes, as we all have, um, that the God who loves me, the God who sent God's son to die for me, still embraces me and enfolds yeah. me and allows me to be at this table. Yeah. And so for that, I am absolutely humbled and grateful. And I would say to all of us who are assembled here, there is room for all of us. God turns no one away. And we could spend all day, as we will probably today, um, talking and, and debating. Um, but when I come down to the compassionate love of Christ that made room for me when I never deserved it, then it reminds me that I have nothing else better to do but to love with the radical love of Christ, everyone that I encounter. And that's what's going to transform the world. Whether we realize it or not, we have all been helped by Dr. Pierce, Pastor T, Dr. Rivers, Dr. Bickle. Can you join me in giving a hand to them? Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's up everybody, this is Lisa Fields, the founder and president of the Jew3 Project, and I'm so excited to come to you to talk about Courageous Conversations 2022. That's right, we're at it again for another year. The theme this year is the scholar and the skeptic. We're back in Washington, D.C. at National Community Church with seven amazing conversations. Conversations like, is there a God? Should we trust the Bible? Is Christianity a white man's religion? Does Christianity oppress women? Is Christianity homophobic and transphobic? Should we be spiritual or religious? Is Christianity bad for our mental health? We want to give you a blueprint on how to have courageous conversations with gentleness and respect. Remember, we sold out last time, so make sure you register early and get your ticket now. If you can't join us in person, you have the virtual option as well, but don't miss this year. Register today at CourageousConvos.org.